This video is sponsored by Lark. What lies beneath the Arctic waves is in stark contrast to the barren icy wasteland on top, and in recent years it has become a hotly contested arena. This is the race for the Arctic, and it's happening right now. In fact, we made a video about this that we'll link to here, and it was the whole point of it. The race is on to claim the vast natural resources and strategic advantages hidden beneath the Arctic's frozen surface. But this race isn't just a power grab for national pride. It's a battle for supremacy that could have far-reaching implications for everyday people like you and me, especially now that China has thrown its hat in the ring. So why should you care about this race for the Arctic? And what are the implications of this contest for power and wealth? Let's find out. I'm Ricky, and this is 2-Bit DaVinci. A couple of weeks ago, we posted a video discussing my theory that the Chinese spy balloons that traverse the country may have been originally destined for the Arctic and was blown off course. At first, I thought it was just a wild idea, but as I did more research, I found that it made a lot more sense. The Arctic is a unique region that covers everything above the Arctic Circle, which is a 9,900 mile long circle at a latitude of 66.5 degrees north. This part of the world is actually a lot bigger than you probably think, spanning approximately 8 million square miles roughly 20 million square kilometers, which is twice the size of the United States and about one half larger than Russia, the biggest country in the world by surface area. The Arctic is a fascinating place. It gets its name from the Greek word Arctos, which means bear, in reference to the polar bears that live there, and to the North Star Polaris, which is in the Ursa Major or Great Bear constellation. Also, it's the complete opposite of Antarctica. That's where the anti in Antarctica actually comes from. And I don't mean just because it's on the opposite pole. While Antarctica Antarctica is a landmass covered with huge sheets of ice and surrounded by the ocean. The Arctic is actually an ocean with a floating sheet of ice surrounded by land. It's true. Many people don't know that there's no land underneath the North Pole. It's just a sheet of floating ice on top of the Arctic Ocean. Now, penguins live in Antarctica, which is mostly uninhabited. But in the Arctic is actually home to one of the oldest civilizations, the Inuit people, who have lived there for thousands of years. Finally, the Arctic is a resource-rich region with tons of fish, oil, natural gas, and minerals, most of which have been locked away under a sheet of ice. But that's about to change. You see, the ice has been melting for some time, but now it's melting faster than ever before, and it won't be long until it melts away completely. This has climatologists in an uproar, because besides homeless polar bears and Inuits, losing the Arctic sheet of sea ice could have devastating consequences if their models are correct. And if you're worried about rising sea levels and coastal cities flooding, yeah, you're not wrong. But of course, it is a little bit complicated because a lot of that ice is already in the ocean. So it's only the part that's above land that will contribute to rising sea levels. And also ice is a little bit not as dense as water. Anyways, it will be a problem, but it might not be as bad as you think. But that's not to say that it'll be inconsequential since the ice melting can destabilize the polar jet stream and impact ocean currents, destabilizing the climate all around the world. Also, that sheet of ice is a reflective layer that sends a lot of the light hit that hits it back out into space. And if that's gone, that light is gonna be absorbed by the oceans, further increasing the temperatures in those areas. Bit of a runaway effect. But I'm not here to talk about the long-term climate change today. I'm here to talk about the other more direct consequences it'll have on you and me. But before we get there, do you know who isn't worried at all about the ice melting? Big oil companies. In fact, ironically, the very companies that so many hold accountable for so much of the world's greenhouse gas emissions are also the ones that stand to gain the most from the ice melting. Oh, irony, you cruel mistress. This is precisely the context in which the race for the Arctic unfolds. Let's start with the race for the Arctic's natural resources. Clearing the ice will allow us to explore and exploit natural resources from the Arctic seabed, and there's a lot of resources there. A 2008 study from the U.S. Geological Survey concluded that there is an estimated 90 million barrels of oil, 1,700 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, and 44 billion barrels of natural gas liquids remaining to be found in the Arctic, of which approximately 84% is expected to be in the Arctic seabed. That's over twice the United States total oil reserves, 44 billion barrels, and in the same ballpark as United Arab Emirates Reserve. It just hit me recently that the whole plot of the Disney Pixar movie Cars 2 about Miles Axelrod and his gang finding the world's largest untapped oil reserves could have been inspired by the discovery of the Arctic Reserves since the movie started production in 2008, the same year the USGS study was published. What do you think? Coincidence? Moving on. The 1,700 trillion cubic foot natural gas found in the Arctic is about the same as Russia's total gas reserve and roughly equal to one fourth of the entire world's 
proven reserves. We also saw how the war on Ukraine disrupted Europe's gas supply. That wouldn't have happened if Europe had access to these resources. But it also is why Russia is so hellbent on getting its hand on the Arctic. It'll lose much of its current leverage in the world market if the rest of the world doubles its reserve. This is precisely why Russia is building the largest liquefied natural gas project on the Arctic, the joint stock company YAML, LNG, on its YAML Peninsula. But before we get back to that, let me tell you about our sponsor this week, Lark. I've had my Lark pitcher and bottle for almost a year now, and I seriously love and use them every single day. The Lark Pure Viz pitcher eradicates up to 99.9999% of bacteria, not to mention lead, chlorine, mercury, cadmium, copper, zinc, and VOCs. Plus, with its built-in battery and UVC light, it cleans itself every two hours. If you've ever noticed that odor coming out of your old traditional water filters, the Lark Pure Viz is going to be a breath of fresh air. Then there's the filter bottle. And as you can see, this thing has been used a lot. I went on three international trips in 2022, and I have even more planned in 2023. And I've taken my Lark bottle on every single trip. I try to avoid eating or drinking anything out of plastic. So having this on travel has been a lifesaver. Maybe the water at the hotels and places I visit is safe. But being a visitor, I always get that added peace of mind knowing I have a built-in filter everywhere I go. Plus, it keeps my water cold for up to 24 hours, saves a ton of plastic waste, and saves me like $500 a year on throwaway plastic water bottles. Subscribe to automatic filter replacements and never worry about clean drinking water again. So check out the awesome line of Lark products and see which one is right for you. Links in the description. Huge thanks to Lark and you for supporting the show. The Arctic is already known for its vast amounts of minerals. It's home to several diamond mines, including the Canadian Diavik and Ikati mines in the Northwest Territories, which are jointly produce about 100 million carats of diamonds every year. The Alaskan Arctic also houses one of the largest zinc and lead mines in the world, and Russia's Norilsk nickel deposit is also one of the largest in the world. But there are plenty of minerals waiting to be discovered underneath the ice. Rare earth elements are believed to be present in the Arctic seabed, according to a 2013 report by the British Geological Survey. There is also evidence to suggest that massive uranium deposits may be present in the Arctic seabed as well. The Kavanfield project, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, in southern Greenland is a proposed mining project that aims to extract uranium and rare earth elements from a site in the Ilamausak complex. The project is a joint venture between the Australian company Greenland Minerals, GML, and guess who? China. Of course. Again, more on that in a minute. According to GML, the Cavanfield project has an estimated resources of 956 million pounds of total rare earth oxides and 11.1 million pounds of uranium, which sounds like a lot, but it's really not, considering that the world reserves are around 1,000 times greater. But still, not something you want somebody else mining for in your own backyard. Another promising resource is fish. As the ice melts, vessels can move further north to profit from new fishing waters full of bluefin tuna and mackerel. This is really good news for Greenland, whose exports are 90% from the fishing industry. Okay, so resources in the Arctic are a thing. But that's not the only reason why nations are fighting for the north, right? The second most important thing is the possibility of opening new shipping routes. Remember how I said that the Arctic is melting? Well, to be clear, the Arctic sheets of ice do grow and shrink every year depending on the seasons, as the time lapse of satellite images show. The problem is that the maximum size it grows to every year has been steadily declining for the past several decades, reaching an all-time low in March 2017. The latest maximum was on February 25, 2022, which was the 10th lowest on record. So what this means is that the ice isn't growing as much every winter and it's getting melted quicker every summer. At the current rate, scientists predict that the Arctic will be almost completely free of ice during the summer by as early as 2030. That's That sounds really soon, but what do I know? It could be mostly free of ice year round by some part as early as 2040 and completely free of ice all year round well before the end of the century. Now, as horrible as that sounds, one possible benefit is that the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans become connected through the Arctic Ocean in one big navigatable passage across the North Pole. This will eventually open two important shipping routes, the Northwest Passage and the Northern Sea Route, also dubbed the Northeast Passage. The Northwest Passage connects the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans through the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. The route consists of a series of waterways that wiggle between islands in the Arctic, and today it's mostly ice covered for much of the year. But the melting of the Arctic seas is making the Northwest Passage increasingly accessible for shipping. 
The Northwest Passage is a touchy subject between the U.S. and Canada, as we've been in constant dispute for decades. However, it seems likely that Canada has the better claim. Regardless, the question is, why does this matter? Well, if these routes become ice-free, it'll be a major shortcut for all shipping between the Northwest Atlantic and the Pacific. Passing through the Canadian Arctic would cut shipping distances by more than 4,000 miles which could cut shipping costs for goods shipped from the East Coast to Southeast Asia by as much as 15% if the routes are only open and free of ice for around two or four months, and triple that if they're open all year round compared to the same routes like through that Panama Canal or the Suez Canal. This can impact the final price you pay for imported goods and services. For example, the average price of a Chinese EV is a little over $30,000, and the average cost to ship it to the U.S. is about $6,000. So that's $36,000, of which 16% comes from shipping. If the new route cuts shipping prices by 40 to 45% once the passage is clear year round, it could bring the price down by as much as $2,700, 7.5% less than the original price. Your car would also arrive much sooner. Shipments from China take 30 to 40 days on average. Cutting distance by 40% can potentially cut shipping times by the same amount. So a shipping could take as little as 18 days to arrive. Right next to the Northwest Passage, there'll be another route controlled by Russia called the Northern Sea Route. This route runs along the northern coast of Russia from the Barents Sea into the west through the Bering Strait in the east. The route passes through the Arctic Ocean and the Laptev, East Siberian, and Chukotka Seas. The routes too will be a cheaper, more attractive alternative to the traditional routes through the Suez Canal. This shipping route has the potential to significantly reduce shipping distances and costs between Europe and Asia. For example, from Yokohama, Japan to Rotterdam, UK, the traditional SSR route through the Mediterranean Sea and the Suez Canal is 20,900 kilometers long, while through the Northern Sea Route, it would only be 13,700 kilometers long, cutting the distance by 7,200 kilometers, about 34%. The main consequence of opening the NSR is that there will be a shift in international trade from Europe increasing its trade with Asia. It will also be a heavy blow for Egypt who makes around $8 billion a year from the Suez Canal, amounting to about 2% of the country's entire GDP. Last but definitely not least, the Arctic's strategic location simultaneously near America, Europe, and Asia makes it a battleground for military control. All the countries that have a claim on the region have been steadily increasing their military presence, especially Russia. Despite the outcome of the invasions of Ukraine and its crippling military forces, Russia has been reactivating old Cold War era military bases and building new ones in the past decade. Today, Russia's bases in the region outnumber NATO's by almost a third. Are we looking at a new Cold War? I mean, like a really cold one, like below negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. But seriously though, I can't stress enough how important the Arctic is for us and not because of its new trade routes or natural resources, it's because of national security. You see, if China or North Korea wanted to hit us with a nuclear intercontinental ballistic missile or ICBM, it would have to pass through the Arctic because it's the shortest route here. This makes this region the best possible place to set up a missile defense against ICBMs or to protect us from an all out Chinese or North Korean attack. Something to think about. You don't think about this very often, but in a lot of ways, the Arctic is kind of this cap that has separated these parts of the world. And if you removed it, suddenly it's like when the water evaporates and there's a land bridge that separated two nations by a lake. It's massively disruptive in terms of how we've always thought about the nature of geography and geopolitics in general. So by now you've seen why nations like Canada and the US, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and Russia, all of which have territorial claims within the Arctic Circle are so eager to set up shop in the North, but they're not the only ones. As I mentioned in the beginning, China is also investing heavily in the region and leveraging its partnership with Russia. Remember Russia's massive Yamal LNG plant? The main stakeholders are Novatech of Russia, which holds 50%, but 30% belongs to China National Petroleum Corporation and China's Silk Road Fund, making China the project's second largest stakeholder. And that Kavenfeld project in southern Greenland to mine uranium and rare earth metals, that one is run by the Australian-based company Energy Transitions Materials, which is owned by the Chinese company Shanghai Resources Holding Company. Fun fact, one of our viewers from Iceland mentioned that China's embassy is the biggest there, even though there aren't many Chinese in the country. Big shout out to Axel Kolbiansen. Hope I'm saying that right, by the way. Thank you for that. After that, I decided to dig a little deeper and discover that Iceland was actually the first European country to sign a trading agreement with China in 2015. And today, China's investments in the country add up to 6% 
of Iceland's GDP over the past five years. They even opened an Arctic Science Observatory there. So it's safe to say that China has a strong tie with Iceland. And in fact, they're even building a deep seaport in the Nordic Island nation, setting things up for when the polar routes open for business. So while China doesn't seem interested in pushing its military presence into the Arctic at the moment, it is definitely interested in the region, which may explain the spy balloon or possibly even two other unidentified objects that were both taken down in Alaska and Canadian territories several days after the first balloon. So that is a look at why the Arctic is such a big deal. A lot of us probably never think about it. It isn't really even a continent, right? The seven continents, the Arctic isn't one of them because it's a floating sheet of ice. But as that ice melts away, the entire geopolitical structure that we've known around the world in our modern world today completely changes. And I think it has countries racing to be the first to lay their claim to have better imaging or mapping of where the oil reserves are or to identify shipping routes and to be the first ones to get there. And it's going to be really contested because every country only has 200 miles of sovereignty off their coast. So we mentioned Denmark and Russia and the US, Canada, they all have some claim. But what will the future hold? It's going to be really interesting. And if you guys have any insight that we missed, sound off in the comments as you always do. And that is a look at the race for the Arctic and why it's heating up. All right, if you like this video, check out this one next, I think you're gonna like. And until next week, I'm Ricky with Tuba Da Vinci. Thank you so much for watching.